I'd like to call the school board meeting for Tuesday, June 21st, 2016 to order. Please take the roll. Ms. Langford? Here. Ms. Ellsburn? Here. Ms. Anderson? Here. Mr. Barron? Here. Ms. Caldwell Johnson? Here. Ms. Newcomb? Here. Ms. Bosen? Here. First item on our agenda is approval of the agenda. Uh, may I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda? I'm going to turn to Ms. Caldwell Johnson. I move approval of the agenda absent item number 11 on consent, which I would like to pull for a separate vote. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Ms. Caldwell Johnson, second by uh, Ms. Newcomb. Uh, please vote. Motion passes 7 0. Uh, next item is approval, uh, next on our agenda, rather, is approval of the minutes. May I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from June 7th, 2016? I'll make a motion. Second. Motion by Ms. Newcomb, second by Ms. Caldwell Johnson. Please vote. Motion passes 7 0. Uh, next item on the agenda is district recognitions. Uh, None tonight, so we'll move on to uh, our consent uh, items. Uh, we have any person the opportunity to speak to the board for up to five minutes following presentation of an agenda item. If anyone wishes to speak to an agenda item, please go to the information desk to sign up. Remarks <coughs> must be germane to the agenda, and we ask that you avoid reference to personalities and character attacks as those types of, of comments serve no productive purpose. As a reminder to the board and public, the board will not engage in discussion or deliberation with the speaker regarding comments made to agenda items. Discussion and deliberation will remain among board members at the board table, with speakers' comments informing said discussion, deliberation, and determinations as deemed necessary. We appreciate your input. Ms. Ellsburn, do you have the motion? I do. I move that the board approve the consent items in accordance with the recommended action for each item on the consent agenda, including bills previously authorized, certified, and approved for payment by the board secretary in the amount of $5,493,043.87. Ms. Newcomb? We have a second. I'll second. Motion by Ms. Ellsburn, second by Ms. Bozen. Please vote. Motion passes 7-0. We will uh, we'll move on to the public hearing and then jump back to item 11 from consent uh, before we hit the other other items. So, uh, so the next item on the agenda is uh, item E1, public hearing for the replacement of air handling units in the Central Campus Gymnasium. Public hearing will come to order. Is there anyone wishing to speak to item E1, public hearing for the replacement of air handling units at the Central Campus Gymnasium? Hearing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Dr. Ahart, would you please present the matter? Following the public hearing, I recommend the board approve the proposed plans and specifications prepared by Alvin Han Excuse me, I'm, uh, my screen's not cooperating. Prepared by Alvine Engineering, for replacement of the air handling units in the gymnasium at Central Campus. Uh, I have a motion and a second to approve. We'll move approval. Second. Motion by Ms. Ellsburn, second by Ms. Caldwell Johnson. Please vote. Motion passes 7 0. Uh, next, before moving to the other items, we'll move to item 11 from the consent agenda. May I have a motion and a second to approve that item, which is staff compensation for FY17, FY18 associates and secretaries. Move approval. Second. Motion by Ms. Bozen, second by Ms. Ellsburn. Is there any um, discussion on this item? Uh, I'll be abstaining on this item as I have a family member who's in this category. Very good, thank you. Uh, seeing no more discussion, I'll uh, ask for a vote. Motion passes 6-0 with one abstention. Uh, next item is uh, item F1, open enrollment appeal for denial. Uh, may I have a motion and a second to approve uh, or to deny this appeal? So moved. Second. 
Motion by Ms. Caldwell Johnson, second by Ms. Bozen. Is there any discussion? Ms. Newcomb. Um, not particularly this this specific instance. I just want to thank everyone for once again removing it from the consent agenda. I really appreciate that. So I want to acknowledge that. Thank you. With no further discussion, we have a motion and a second, so I'll ask for a vote. Vote is approved, 7-0. Next item on our agenda is item F2, State Assessments Monitoring Report. This is an action item, and we will have a presentation, but first I'll ask for a motion uh, to uh, approve this monitoring report. Motion. Second. Oh, motion by Ms. Anderson, okay, second by <laughs> Ms. Caldwell-Johnson. I will allow our presenters to find their seats and turn the mic over to them. Good evening. Um, for the monitoring report tonight, we have two key performance indicators, um, one of them being percent of students proficient on um, the state accountability test, and the other percent of students making or exceeding typical growth. We'll take a look at the data first. Um, here you see the reading um, percent proficient. Um, you'll notice that for grades three, five, uh, we remained relatively unchanged um, with a slight decrease of 0.9%. Um, same would hold true for middle and high school with a slight increase of 0.3 for grade 6, 8, and a slight decrease of 0.2 for grades 9, 11. When looking at percent making at least typical growth, um, for grades 4, 5, and 6, 8, there was a decrease. However, when you look at um, 2013 and compare it to 2016, which we're able to do because the form um, is the same, you'll see that it remained 1.3% higher for elementary, 3% higher for grades 6 to 8, and then for grades 9 to 11, remained relatively unchanged with a decrease of 1%. For math percent proficient, uh, for elementary grades 3, 5, it remained relatively unchanged from 15 to 16 with a 0.2% increase. And in grades 6 to 8 and 9 to 11, we did have a decrease for grades 6 to 8. It was 2.3%. And 9 to 11 is 2.5%. Looking at Iowa assessment um, percent, making at least uh, typical growth, uh, grades four to five increased by 4.1% from 15 to 16, um, grades six to eight decreased by 3.6%, and ninth to 11th grade decreased by 3.7%. Wow, is there one more comment? Good evening, board. Uh, we are uh, transitioning to a better system, which we know you know and appreciate um, your support in that. So just a couple highlights uh, around the Iowa assessments that are up on the screen right now. And, and again, none of this is a surprise to you. Um, we know that the Iowa assessments are not aligned to Iowa's curriculum. We know that they're not designed to measure growth, even though we've attempted to create a system to measure growth the last few years out of the Iowa assessment. Um, we know that the definition of proficient is arbitrary, especially as it relates to our uh, core curriculum. And we also know that it's autopsy data, given in the spring each year and at a time when it's um, not very actionable, quite frankly. So a couple other things that I just want to add to that. In, in addition to these short list, quite frankly, of, of uh, lack of strengths for the Iowa assessment. Uh, it also often, and this year is an example, conflicts with other data sources. For example, um, and for our FAST data, uh, kindergarten and first graders improved uh, uh, proficiency across the board. Additionally, all levels, elementary, middle, and high, improved in the scholastic uh, math inventory, contrary 
to what the Iowa assessment data would suggest. Additionally, uh, on the scholastic reading inventory, which we give multiple times per year, uh, the middle and high school um, proficiency increased, just the opposite of what occurred with the autopsy data from the Iowa assessment. So we're, we all often struggle with what does this mean exactly? And the bottom line, um, we're excited about transitioning to a system where we believe meaning will be uh, a far more uh, actionable for us. Uh, Wilma's gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but the um, ESSA will provide a natural opportunity to revisit how we use assessment to inform instruction. Uh, we've learned a lot over the past many decades of using uh, Iowa assessment and Iowa assessment-like um, assessments, and uh, we know that we need an assessment that's aligned to our goals and also our instructional practice that we can action upon in real time, and you'll learn a little bit more um, about that. Specifically uh, regarding the schools for rigor model, which, which you know uh, we're moving forward with, great benefits in that model will be our ability to uh, have instructional data in real time where teachers will be able to that day within the lesson uh, monitor and change instruction so that we'll actually have um, just the opposite of autopsy data. Instead, instead we'll have literally a real time class by class um, data and, and as I know you know, that will roll up from six schools next year to the entire district over the coming few years. Wilma's now going to give you more details about our transition to ESSA. Good evening, thanks. I'm gonna do my best to give you an update on where we are. The issue though is right now we are in no man's land. <laughs> Um, no Child Left Behind officially sunsets August 1st, and ESSA, which was passed in December of 2015, the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, the current and second semester of the current school year and next school year is a planning period. So we're kind of living in the 16-17 school year with one foot in NCLB in a, in a very small way, and what we can put our feet in in terms of ESSA. So um, just for clarity's sake, the slides I have, with the exception of the last one, are taken directly from information, uh, slides that the Iowa Department of Education provided, because I wanted to be sure that I'm giving you very accurate information and not putting my slant or twist on it. So um, ESSA reauthorizes um, uh, the every student, uh, the elementary and secondary education act for another four years. Um, it states that uh, states may choose challenging academic standards without interference from the federal government. And in essence, it really, the big picture view is it gives control back to the states. So the states will be writing plans that are, that are due um, in the winter of 2016-17, the Department of Education will review them. But our understanding right now is that um, uh, there probably will be um, minimal um, changes from the department because of the flexibility that it gets that gives uh, states once we have all the rules out. So, um, so what's in ESSA? Um, a state-determined accountability model. So it allows us to establish um, state-designed long-term goals with measures of interim progress for all students. They need to be based on academic achievement, graduation rates, and ELL proficiency for, for um, English learners. And they haven't defined it at this point, but we need to give substantial weight to uh, the academic indicators. Uh, Right now, our understanding is the Iowa Department of Education is going to use the state report card model as a model to begin from, but that they also are gonna be asking for input, which um, I'm assuming that we will be glad to provide them on that. Mm -hmm. um, then there are a couple of things that will not be required in, uh, in the 16-17 school year as we transition. Part of what um, is important to remember is, I think there are eight states that do not have a waiver from NCLB. 
And those states that do have a waiver, so the preponderance of states, when they wrote their proposals, in essence, they wrote out of it things like school choice, and they wrote out of it supplemental education services, the before and after school tutoring that's available to low-income students in Title I buildings. So those very few states that don't have a waiver still have been implementing those things. So um, there is a transition plan for the 16-17 school year. And in essence, school choice and SES are two pieces that we are not required to implement. And, um, but we need to have a plan for how to support students and, and continue with our efforts. And basically around school choice, um, what the department is requiring us to do and is the right thing to do is that those students who already were approved for school choice will continue as they were promised when they were approved to go to the school, their, their new school of choice until the time of matriculation and that um, students approved for school choice will continue to have transportation as, as we had promised them. Um, if in some rare examples a student um, had a sibling, an older sibling, and they went to that school of choice, not as a school choice student, but a within district transfer student, those students would continue to have bus transportation as long as their older sibling was there. We are preparing some letters that we are going to send out to all the students who are currently participating in school choice to provide the clarification for them so that they'll have that information and can rest assured that, that they're in, in, in good shape for that. Um, <coughs> in terms of um, uh, supplemental education services, which is our before and after school tutoring, um, we have to maintain effort with those. So our, our plan is to continue to implement. We, last year, there were 31 approved tutoring providers for Des Moines Public Schools. One of them was Des Moines Public Schools. And we had what we called our DMPS Extended Learning Program. And we used um, uh, district um, supported software and small instruction, um, group instruction to support kids with Des Moines Public Schools teachers. And we will, um, we I think need to do a couple things to clarify some of the aspects of that, but we will continue to do that um, in Title I schools, um, K through 12. Um, <coughs> the other piece of it uh, that has, um, is part of our transition is that the Department of Education elected to freeze AYP status. So whatever your school in need of improvement status is for the 15-16 school year will carry forward to the following school year. They um, could have continued with AYP designation, but chose not to, I think probably wisely, because that's NCLB, it's, it's not, um, the new Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, so really the only thing that that means for us is that um, our Title I schools will still carry the same designation that they did last year. And if um, they will continue to re receive um, SINA dollars, school in need of assistance dollars. We have some new schools that we, eight new schools that we added on this year they will not receive those funds. Um, and it amounts to probably eight to $10,000 a school for additional efforts. Um, but we will, we, AYC, AYP status has been frozen for 16, 17. Um, so <coughs> as we move forward, the new system will go in place for the 17, 18 school year. 2015-16 is the last year for data submission under NCLB. So, so consequently, we're, we are, are not having our AYP status re reviewed again. We will, however, because the Iowa assessments, and you know, as folks have mentioned, are really part of Iowa code and, and how the Iowa report card is reported, we will still take Iowa assessments next year because it's a, it's, mandatory, it's a requirement, it's a compliance issue. Um, so moving forward, the Department of Education is in the process of writing the state plan. They have their own committees established at the department level. And as I understand it, we'll soon be opening up 
committees for the public to be a part of, and um, ESSA clearly articulates the groups that need to be represented in there. You know, um, people from the LEA, um, parents, community members, um, so there's a, a long list of people that need to be communicated with or um, included, and both Tom and I have commuted very communicated really clearly with the department about our interest in having people from the Des Moines Public Schools, both community and staff people, be represented on those committees. So um, just kind of in summary, AYP won't be calculated next year. Title I schools, their school in need of assistance dollars will be roughly the same, and we don't know what the status of those dollars will be moving forward starting in the fall of 2017. That's part of what needs to be settled in the plan. No new opportunities for schools choice, and our tutoring program will be based with um, Des Moines curriculum and Des Moines teachers. And we'll keep you posted. That's what we know right now. Evan. Thank you for the presentation. I have one quick question, and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Anderson. <coughs> On the uh, monitoring report, was it um, what was the what was the status that, that? Yeah, I apologize that that wasn't marked. It should be partially compliant. Okay, it's not marked. All right. Thank you for that, Ms. Anderson. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of a agree with what basically you said at the beginning. It's really hard to be a teacher and, and give a test and then get the results in the spring, one-time results, and, and it's often like you send it home with them at the very end of the year. Um, have a nice summer. Um, so I totally agree um, with not putting a lot of value in that one test. Um, but I wonder if there's if there's a plan to kind of educate the public and parents and um, you know just about just about the Iowa assessments a little bit more because I know because I'm a teacher but um, a lot when I was young I remember getting those and thinking this is the one test that says who I am you know now I know hopefully that wasn't right but <laughs> um, I just think that more outreach um, would be good. And um, I know we talked about it maybe during the meeting, um, Wilma, a little bit about uh, the other tests that we do, that you do more often. And I think it'd be helpful for parents. Maybe you already have a plan for parents to know a little bit more about it. Actually, the uh, School Improvement Advisory Committee is gonna help us um, okay. figure out how to best communicate that. But we'll have, with the map testing, I think you're referring to, that's gonna give us a great opportunity yeah. to sort of wipe the slate clean and, and um, help educate our families with more clarity about what the different assessments are and what the mm -hmm. purposes and the strengths and weaknesses of those various assessments are. Yeah, Because I, I know that parents just, they don't understand and they see that <coughs> one test and they, so if we could just, you know, really yeah. get them to understand that we and have that, to give it, but you know. That really appears to be an interest of, of that the SIAC committee, the yeah. School Improvement Advisory Committee, really engaged people who want us to help us communicate with um, parents and the public in in um, friendly terms right. to help them understand these changes. Thank you. Nobody wants it. Ms. Caldwell Johnson. So I have just a couple of clarifying questions just so I make sure I understand sort of what's happening during the transition phase. Mm -hmm. So um, the SES services that you say are not required, you said the district will continue to provide those. Will the other 30 providers be allowed to? No. It, and it's not exactly that the services aren't required. It's that we have to show how we're maintaining effort there and that we have um, the opportunity then to maintain effort through our own program rather than um, using other um, private organizations to do that. Okay. And remind me how that's funded. Is that funded through Title I? It's mm -hmm. a set aside from Title I. Right. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. 
All right. So we've notified those other providers then that those services state has the state taken. has. Yes. And the, and I've gotten actually a couple of questions from a couple of other providers. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the process of kind of preparing a, um, both for the schools and provi for providers kind of an overview of what our services will look like that will hopefully clarify for them um, why we're not using outside providers. So. so is it the responsibility then of those companies or the district to communicate with the families and children who would have received services from those other entities? The Des Moines Public Schools communicates with the families each year about tutoring services. And that list of providers changes every year depending on who the Iowa Department of Education approved. They are no longer approving providers. They're asking districts how they're going to maintain those, the, those services. So um, we will do what we did last year, which and, and, and every year previous to that is send letters home to parents saying, here are the services that are available at your own school. Here's how we're going to provide them, and you have the opportunity um, to sign up for those services. Okay. Um, and then I had another question around the um, schools of choice. So just to make sure I'm clear on that one as well, that is for students who typically would have been at a school in need of assistance but have the ability to opt to go to another school. Is right. that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. a, okay. a Title I school in correct. need of assistance. And that actually is one of the things that the SIAC brought up. We have a lot of confusing language. We have schools of choice. We have open enrollment. We have within district transfer. And that piece is really confusing, I think, to, to, to parents. So that's part of the reason we want to write this letter to clarify for them um, that they still will have the opportunity right. to continue, but no so new students, opportunities. So students who are already opting into schools of choice will be able to continue, but we Correct. will not allow any new students to transition. Correct. Yes. OK. All right. Um, and then I don't know if I heard this correctly, but did you indicate that we have eight additional <coughs> schools that yes. have moved to the CENA list? Yeah. No. 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 Who, okay. Who, who are who will receive Title One services? Who will next receive year. Title yeah. One services? Okay. I was yeah. when I heard that I was like, oh. Yeah. No. All right. We just we had an uh, unanticipated increase in our Title One allocation, which allowed us to add eight more schools. So okay. It was a good thing. Okay. Very good. Um, I feel like I had another question, but. I don't see it on my list, so I guess I'm finished. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Newcomb. Thank you. Um, now I realize that we've discussed on and off um, throughout the year uh, these test results and the concerns. However, I do, I guess, I mean, they're telling essentially something, though, um, because we have an opportunity here of timeline which we uh, frequently discuss how important it is to have something like that. And here we do. And I guess um, I'm a little put off a little bit by what it, it, it shows, even though I understand with the reservation here with what exactly we are testing. But for example, like in 14, it seemed 2014 a little bit better um, for reading and math. And um, I guess I don't want us to just go, because it's not testing exactly everything right, we should dismiss it. Because mm -hmm. it is telling an important story and um, one that which is very concerning. So I do have a lot of concerns with this. And again, I say that with reservation, but I don't want that to be lost. It's not a good outlook. It really isn't. So appreciate the opportunity to take a look at it. I guess, and I know I, I didn't submit this in advance or anything, so, and I, it's just because it kind of popped up at me here, but like 2014, <coughs> for example, um, typical growth in math, uh, 2014 slightly in, in most areas, three through five and nine through 11, there was a slight increase. And I don't know if there's something telling about what happened in 2014 or not. I know a lot of things are transitioning, but Tom, that's kind of like an open question mark, open question I'm not, mark I'm, type I'm of thing. I'm not sure you're, uh, sure. Are you, what are you looking at? A slide, the, I guess I'm back on the slides. Uh, number, let me say for example. Talking about um, reading, typical growth? Um, well, I was looking at the math, number six, whereas 2014, I'm just looking at that, that bar is slightly up above on everything else on typical growth for math. Um, for which grades? All. 
Oh yeah, that's a that's a as a, well as a, reading. That's a test form. New form issue. Right? They yeah. used a different test, different a different test that year. Okay. So it's it's <clears throat> really difficult to make comparisons. Another, uh, which is another challenge that we have yeah. with Iowa assessments and trying to translate what's this, what does this really mean? The other thing I want to, especially for our community, because I think our board, uh, our board understands this, and Tim referenced this. Iowa assessments are not designed to measure growth, and what we've tried to do, since this is something that is relied on by the state and the fe and the federal government until next year, um, mm -hmm. how do we how do we manufacture a, a, a some sort of meaningful growth number on this assessment? And so we've used this this concept of typical growth, but. By definition, anything over 50% typical growth means you're you're beating the odds, you know? And so we can't really, it would be really a flawed um, idea that we could continue to, to um, increase our percent making typical growth every year when we're using a tool designed to keep yeah. everybody uh, on a bell curve. Um, so anytime we're beating typical growth, we're, we're doing pretty darn well um, by this measure. So it's just, um, we, we hesitated to start using this, but we, but just using percent proficient really told almost no story. Um, and so it's, it does help, um, um, illuminate, um, what's happening within our system better than just percent proficient, but it's, it's still, a. a, a a manufactured, if you will, a manufactured um, look at growth. Mm -hmm. So, um, looking very much forward to having better um, data that tells a, a clearer story about what's happening in our classrooms next year. And 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 I agree with Natasha too. R regardless of how flawed <laughs> um, this test is, it's still the state test. So it, it, it still is very important, and and um, none of us is satisfied with with the numbers that we're getting. Thank you, Ms. Langford. Thank you all for your presentation. Um, you ref I just had two questions. You referenced um, the FAST assessment um, and talking about some of the gains you had seen with some of those students and another assessment I can't remember. Scholastic, well, scholastic math and reading. The scholastic math and reading. Thank you. And I was just, I did not ask this question before, so I do not expect any solidified data but it's it speaks to a larger trend question to me and i'm just wondering if we saw um similar rates of improvement with our students of color and our special education students and our so low socioeconomic students low income students on those assessments okay. at all and we just we have the initial data on those assessments in it we don't have it broken down by subgroup yet okay we still have Two schools completing the assessments all, all that okay. we're waiting on. Right. Yeah, awesome. but you will be receiving all of those in in upcoming monitoring reports. Yeah, yeah the no, purpose was wasn't asking. really to reference that data, other than to s talk about to say it. some small highlights or some gains. Sure, mm -hmm. I just wanted to, right. but I know we'll be seeing it a little later. Well, um, so thank you for that. And then the second question was just around um, communication with parents through letters, and I know we um, we talk a lot about um, how we communicate with our parents. And I'm just wondering, do we for our non-English language, or non, our families who don't speak English isn't their first language, do all the letters go out in English, or they do go out? And we, um, I think we have them translated into eight different languages. Wonderful. Yep. And and also let the schools know that there are some of our families who, who um, the dialects aren't, we don't have a sure. way to communicate with them in written form, so we ask the bilingual workers to communicate with those families if we have, so we, we really make, a, a tremendous effort to to do that, and we're looking at how we can also um, uh, for the um, ESSA web page that we're working on how we can have that translated so that parents will have access to that. Awesome. So, thank you. Yeah. Further questions? Okay. Now we have a motion and a second to approve the monitoring report. I'll move. Oh, we already have one. Have we already have one. Oh, we did it before we did the report, didn't yeah. we? Right. Yeah. No, oh yeah, no. I, yeah, I was saying we have a motion oh, okay. in a second. Oh. Okay. oh. Um, I was and I was waiting for the vote screen to come up, but please vote. 
And it's partial? But it's yeah. partial. Thank you. Motion passes 7 0. Next on my agenda is item F3 School Infrastructure Sales, Services, and Use Tax Revenue Refunding Bond Series 2016. Uh, this is an action item, and I'll take a motion. Move approval. I'll second. Motion by Ms. Caldwell Johnson, and second by Ms. Bozen. Uh, there is no presentation scheduled here. Are there any questions? I just got. I would like to make a few comments. Mr. Uh, Harper. The, what you've been asked to approve tonight, you know, you know, we have a winning bidder. It's the, um, the BB&T Bank. Uh, I think what is really, really significant about this is you know, the rate that we were able to get and the amount of money that we will save over the life of this this refund and it's right around a million dollars a year. Now let me let me be clear about this. This is not general fund. This is capital projects. Uh, so this goes back in state by penny. These are revenue bonds, so it goes back to be used for future construction projects and so forth. That's awesome. Um, Thomas, do you want to, um, maybe you're planning on doing this, but just m mentioning um, the, the state the district was in when those um, initial bonds were were um, issued. This was, this was um, 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. and all bonds are issued, uh, whether they be general obligations or uh, revenue bonds, or issued with the callable. You can call them at a certain date, certain time, and this is what we were doing. And if you think about what the interest rate was, I mean, at, the, at that time, I think the interest rates were, when we issued those things, around 5%, and, with, and, and so the rate on these would be like about right around 2 by refunding. So here again, if you kind of liken this to refinancing your house, and then uh, you get the savings and so forth. Uh, you know, it's also probably as a financial strategy as we move forward, we have a whole number of other series will be coming, be callable, and we'll probably fi follow the same process. So uh, it's just another way for us to manage our debt and <clears throat> both in terms of uh, for you know uh, to uh, to have additional money to go to additional projects, but also you know stick, strictly from a taxpayer standpoint, uh, albeit these are sales taxes. Mm -hmm. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Comment from the board? No. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion passes 7-0. I declare the resolution adopted. Thank you. Thank you. We need a roll call vote on that. Please call the roll. Ms. Langford? Yes. Ms. Ellsburn? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Barron? Yes. Ms. Caldwell-Johnson? Yes. Ms. Newcomb? Yes. And Ms. Bozen? Yes. Thank you. That was the weirdest rule. I declare the resolution adopted. That's the weirdest rule that you have to do a roll call. No, it's all right. You gotta do the stuff right. Next item on our agenda is item F4, our board monitoring calendar. This is also an action item. I'll take a motion to adopt our board monitoring calendar. Move approval. We have a second? Second. Motion by Ms. Bose and second by Ms. Newcomb. Uh, no presentation on this item. Uh, this is the um, this is the product of, of a few months of work and and, um, and a few back and forths and I appreciate the superintendent A Hart uh, putting together uh, the final draft that we we have in front of us and and I'll open the floor for any any questions or discussion from the board. I do. Is Caldwell Johnson? And really more about how we not only adhere to the schedule, but give ourselves the appropriate time to um, prepare for the um, reports that we're going to receive. And um, one of the things that I think is really important as we've, we've talked about this on any number of occasions is making sure that 
Board members do their homework so that we're prepared and we're asking questions in advance. But I also think that um, one of the things that um, would be really helpful is that um, the superintendent sta and staff keep their reports succinct and to the point to allow appropriate time for us to get through all of the things that the board has on their agenda. Um, I think we all have to add a bit more discipline and rigor to how we function and operate not only as a board, but how the staff interacts with the board and really being focused on making sure that the information that we receive is um, synthesized to the, you know, to the key issues mm -hmm. that we need to have and also that the board <clears throat> takes the time to review that information in advance so that staff is prepared for our questions will facilitate um, what I think is going to be a much more um, timely um, execution of our business as a body. So I just wanted to make sure I added that sort of as an adjunct to the work that we've done on putting together the schedule. And it's appropriate to note at the bottom there's a note that the italicized reports are reports where we will hear a presentation at the board table. Uh, the ones that are not italicized are reports that will go on our consent agenda and will be available to, to read but won't come with a report. I think that change alone will make it more succinct and that will be able to direct us. So just having that change, I think, will be a big, to Terry's point, will get us more geared to and directed to fewer things, but we still have the depth of information we can get, but we're zeroing in on our key points that we all talked about. Further comment? Question? All right, well, thanks to Dr. Ahart uh, and you all for engaging in the discussion at the board meeting last week and, and, and the, um, in the work session afterwards. We have a motion and a second to approve the board monitoring calendar. Please vote. <laughs> motion passes 7-0. Uh, the next item on our agenda is our board self-evaluation. This is not an action item, uh, but it's open to discussion. This is the uh, second quarterly evaluation that we have done of our board performance since we went to a uh, revamped form. Uh, and this form, uh, appreciate uh, all the folks who spent some time uh, re-revamping this form. I think it's, it's getting much better, uh, absent the technical difficulties that we all seem to have in getting it to fill out. Uh, we'll perhaps look for some support from the staff in terms of making, making a fillable PDF that, that works. Um, right. Yeah, help desk, help desk type stuff. But uh, I'll open the floor to conversation. I know Ms. Caldwell Johnson had her hand up. Yep, so one thing that I noticed is um, I think it would be helpful for us to maybe add um, and decide sort of what the, what the year looks like, or maybe we do it sort of on a rolling quarterly calendar, but so we can track over, you know, the quarters where we're seeing movement, activity. So because, you know, in and of itself, these scores are great, but if we don't compare them to where we were in the previous quarter, or we don't have sort of a frame of reference for whether or not uh, we're making progress, we're really sort of doing this in isolation. So it sort of dawned on me as I was completing at this time that maybe if we could um, maybe um, reflect, um, since this is really only the second time we've done it, reflect the first quarter's report, the second quarter, the third, and the fourth, and then as we get to a quarter, the first quarter that would have been the furthest quarterback sort of rolls off. So we have it sort of as a moving target mm -hmm. and we sort of are able to sort of reflect back on whether or not we're making any progress. That's a great idea. Um, just a thought. Yeah, I think that's good. And that'll help build up to December when we have our annual self-evaluation. Right. So that's a good call. Ms. Ellswin. Yes, one of the things that I'll add, um, and I did mention it in the in the in my comments on the second point, I think my thing is, my screen is going back and forth here, um, is that we do need to add our 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, the board management delegation policies to our 
okay. self-evaluation. And I, that dawned on me as I was filling this out. Otherwise, I would have mentioned it okay. when the thing was being revamped again. Okay. That's good. Ms. Bosen. I just want to bring up only because there were some comments made about the committee structure and maybe not being able to do the committee work. And I noticed that we had a report last week that didn't have a board member there that we have two board members assigned. So I just think that if people have a problem, there's other people can fill in. I mean, if uh, because sometimes work gets in the way or whatever. So just know that if that's your assign, if you if that's something you can't do, I think we need to let each other know so it can make sure it can be filled or somebody there to represent the board. I agree. Good point. Thank you. Ms. Ellsburn. I'll also, on the issue of committees, and I, I will say that I do think we need to take some time reviewing that, reviewing their authorization, their scope, all of those things. I, I do think that we have committees that are um, set up to be in direct violation of our policy as far as delegation of work to the superintendent. Our community committees are supposed to help us with board work, not um, not otherwise. So either we need to relinquish some of those or else we need to bring them back into our realm, however that might mm -hmm. be. So I don't know what that looks like as far as um, uh, going through those and, and taking the time to do that, but um, I I think that would be worth doing. Good point. Much appreciated and noted. Ms. Langford. Yes, I was going to also, you know, I can't speak to everybody's committee, but I do know after speaking with the facilitators of the, the youth committee that they had some um, feedback and were just feeling a little you know, if it was created for the board, they could just use some scope and focus and thinking about where we're going. And so in terms of determining, I remember we had, I haven't had the conversation with everybody, but with a couple members, like it was, you know, we said that we were creating it as a vision of the board. Um, I just think there'd be a take place of time to have that conversation. I can't speak for all of them, but particularly the youth committee and where we want it to go and what we want it to be for the board. Additional questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Good discussion. Definitely good points to work on. Uh, some of them relevant to this review, the structure of the review, and some of them just relevant to our, our, our general work. And so we can we can work on these. And so you want the committee to work on this three the three point series? I think that'd be okay. a good next step. Yes. Our next review is in September, so okay. we'll give you guys some lead time on that. All right, uh, next item, uh, items of privilege, chair's report. Uh, I want to um, thank my colleagues and the district for all of the support that um, the district's provided and the leadership that the board has provided uh, with the uh, Read to Succeed uh, campaign and walk and, uh, and I think the anecdotally we're hearing great success stories of folks who are pitching in and volunteering and being interested in being engaged at their door, uh, positively interested in, in, in that engagement. And that's that speaks well of our community, and, and I think it shows that this was a, a good step for us as a board and a, a good opportunity to uh, translate, I think, our what is our desire for increased student achievement uh, into specific board actions. And I want to, I know Connie's really been kind of doing a lot of the behind the scenes work on pushing this thing out. And, uh, uh, and it, if it's every bit as successful as your school board campaigns have been, then I'm, I'm pretty optimistic for where we're going to go on this. I just want to point out too, uh, we kind of made a decision because of the lovely summer weather and the fact that it takes a long time to walk and people are engaging you. So it takes even longer because people are talking 
which is really encouraging. So we've extended it to the month of July. It's just really trying to get every as many doors hit as we can. And because I have been, you know, when I went out Saturday, I was really surprised. I did not think I would be engaged. Now, yeah, I'm kind of in my neighborhood, so I'm talking to neighbors, but some of them I don't know. But they were actually talking back and having a discussion, much different than on a political campaign. People feel good about kids and having the T-shirt, thank you, Phil, with the big Des Moines Public Schools. I got a couple of people to volunteer to walk just because they saw that and they asked, are you a teacher? And I said, no, and I kind of explained what we were doing, and they signed up based on that. So it really brings attention, and um, I think it, for what I found, I think Deanna too, I, and everybody else who's been out, it has been, it's kind of, it's very rewarding, and to know that we're finding people that really want to come in and help the kids. That's even the biggest thing. Everybody knows there's a need. They know they're, and, and a lot of people said, I've been wanting to do this, and now I, this is giving me the push to do it. I've been wanting to do something, so. It was very encouraging. So thank you all for the work of putting together packets and going door to door, and um, it does take work. Anything that's worthwhile does. Yes. Any other comment from the board? I am of privilege. I'll turn it over to Dr. Ahart then for the superintendent's report. All right. Well, I was going to mention read to succeed as well. I think oh, it was. First of all, it was uh, it was great to see volunteers from the district that really represented every department of the district um, on Friday. And what was more powerful was to have five board members there leading the charge. And um, I think that sends a really powerful message to the community. And um, all those all that engagement that's happening door to door goes a lot further, I think, than we think sometimes. And so I think the, the investment in time is well worth it. So congratulations to all. And I'm really excited about what this is going to bring about over the course of the next year and helping support our reading goals, pre-K through three. Um, we had a recognition plan for tonight, but um, due to health reasons, um, our, our um, awardee was not able to attend, but I did want to mention that Sandy Heisman, who is our um, director of food and nutrition, works on Bill's team, was just named the 2015-16 School Nutrition Food Service Director of the Year. So Sandy, if you're watching, <laughs> um, congratulations and thank you. You do outstanding work and you provide such a valuable service to um, that's, that's very much needed for so many of our students and families. Um, and then finally, um, I want to recognize the Office of Schools and um, the Department of Operations in cooperating in very short notice with the Red Cross and with um, Polk County Emergency Management in the city of Des Moines and helping find a place to um, accommodate about 40 residents of the Elliott Apartments um, who were suddenly without a place to stay because of the, the fire at the Elliott Apartments the other night. Um, as of tonight, we are officially out of the housing business. Um, other accommodations have made. I know Bill and his team spent significant time Monday and and um, and this morning trying to find some alternate locations for those folks who were spending, uh, who were residing here at Central Campus. Because as soon as we're here done here tonight, the water is going to be shut off at Central Campus for some construction work that needs to happen, and um, that would have been a, a big inconvenience. And ultimately, um, we would have had to um, move them to a, an alternate location anyway. But Bill was able to find a couple of different possibilities. And as it turns out, um, the services of the district are no longer needed. But it's, a, it's another testament, I think, to the community that we live in, um, that collaboration, real deep collaboration, can happen so quickly, even with large entities. So congratulations to all you folks, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the board, uh, and I will uh, close tonight's meeting.